now. All right, welcome to the right. quarantine check-in with my guest, Cody Calebra. I'm your host, Robert Frank. Cody, how are you surviving the quarantine? Hey, man, I am doing okay. Um, I work from home a lot of the time anyway, so this is not severely weird to me. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. My life's getting more normal than it was before, for sure. Like, I'm That's fucking going to bed at, like, 10 p.m., and, like, it's like events that keep me up late. Otherwise, I'm, I'm pretty fair weather, so... Um, it's actually the first time I've drank in the last two weeks. I have not had a drink in three weeks, four weeks, since right before I tweaked my back. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, I was uh, coming home from my show in Adrian. I slid on some ice, tried to catch myself, and then just slid a disc in my back. Fuck. It Man, sucks. Yeah. yeah. I feel both lucky and unlucky in that my back is not fucked up yet. I guess not when the friends hit up and they're like, hey, man, can you help me move? Sure. I go there and then, you know, seven people are like, oh, oh no, I'm not lifting the heavy shit. My back's all fucked up. Uh, you want to get that and that and that and that? See, I can't wait to get back to when it's, when I'm able to go back across and lift weights again. It's like my mm -hmm. biggest therapy and I miss it. I feel that. Yeah. I, I've got like a couple kettlebell kettlebells and stuff, but. And I was convinced. I took a progress picture day one of the quarantine, like I'm going to get like in shape or some shit. I've been pounding like all this garbage covered food. <laughs> I've been fucking crushing the macaroni and cheese and the rice already. Oops. I've done nothing to work out at all. I took a walk today. I took a little walk. Nice. My complex. And I hate it. Fucking hate it. So enough about that. So how much do you miss comedy right now? Uh, it's a mixed bag. It gave me something to always kind of look forward to and stuff. I had, like, some heavy, like, life shit happen in the last month or so. Like, my dad passed, not to be, like, a bummer or anything like that. But um, I didn't really take any time to process it because I had, like, a new show every week. So I was like, oh, I got to focus on making that next show the best the best that I can. Um, so that was kind of always where I was putting my mind. And I'm like, okay, well, this sucks. But on the plus side, I'll have some time to kind of cool out and, like, you know, deal with my thoughts a little bit. But... My work is uninterrupted, and uh, now everyone's working from home, so I'm getting, like, hit up messages all day and everything like that. Oh, what's up, Kitty? I, yeah, I can't stand working from home. <laughs> it's yeah, I don't, I don't mind it. I don't know. I've got a better setup here, and uh, I don't know. There's a bunch of just random requests at work all day, so uh, it's kind of distracting. But seeing people's pretty fucking cool. I don't know. It is. It is. It is. I miss, uh, yeah. I miss going out to lunch. Going out to lunch is nice. I never cook, and now I'm having to like learn the hard way with like the seven ingredients I have in my house. At least you have ingredients. I just have meal prep and shit that I shouldn't be eating. Like, yeah. Oh, really. I just learned what a gangster move it is to fucking make uh, frozen chicken breast in the Instant Pot. It's why, like, why is it a gangster move? It's basically a microwave. Like, you don't have to do shit. You don't have to wash it. You put it in there for a certain amount of time, and you do nothing else, and bam, chicken breast. So it's so been making, like, a, you know, soft tacos and grilled cheese with chicken on them and shit. That's pretty gourmet. Let's do my own horn, but it's a step above my normal roni configurations, you know? Oh, man. I hate rice roni, though I have plenty of it in the apartment. Big fan. Huge enthusiast. Um... So with comedy, like, I know you were accepted to some festivals. Are they happening or are they not happening? Oh, yeah, they're not happening, and that is a fucking bummer. Um, I was supposed to do uh, the Fort Wayne, Indiana Festival, um, I believe, April 4th, 5th, 6th. Uh, me and Diana Graham were in it, and we found a cool Airbnb right near, like, the home base of all the shows and everything like that. And there were specialty shows. You know, you could sign up for different things you wanted to do. So there's like a roast of Mary Jane, and I'm, I'm a weed comic, so fucking right in my wheelhouse. And then there was another one that was 10-minute uh, craziest stories. And I, I've been meaning to make one of... I've got a lot of fucking crazy stories, and I haven't translated them to the stage yet. Mostly because a lot of them kind of feel like a little braggy, and so I don't want to come off as like a dickhead in that way. But this one that I, I thought about, it's like... It's not braggy, and it is fucking ridiculous and far outside of the experience of most people. So 
I was looking forward to getting that going. Um, but you know, you sure. Um, I can I can give like you know I I haven't jokeified it heavily yet, but uh, I could throw down a yeah, quick explanation of it. Sure. Yeah. All right. So, um, you know, I like to go to a lot of like weird, crazy party things. And so I got invited to this one and I knew very little about it. I just I just heard that it was super cool from people that I trust the judgment of. So um, it was like a camping thing out in a, a remote area. And so I just said, fuck it, caution the wind. Let's go. Um, so I went out there and it was amazing. Like people were out of their minds out there. And the crazy thing about it was. Everything you thought about came true. It, I'm not religious. I'm not super, you know, superstitious very much. But it was fucked up the number of coincidences that, coincidences that were happening. Um, like at one point, there was there was four people I knew there: two of my friends and their wives. So my friends had to go do some shit for the camp, and so I was kind of like babysitting the wives for a little bit. So. Uh, I was like, okay, we'll take this time. We can go over to the beach. And they're like, yeah, let's go to the beach. And they just wanted to sit there. They didn't want to do anything. And all this cool shit was happening around me. I was feeling mad frustrated that I was just stuck with these women just just, just, just wanted to chill there. So uh, I was sitting there talking to one. And all of a sudden, I start hearing like this bombastic, like gypsy funk music playing up the road. And I was like, what the fuck is that? And I look over, and there is a giant fluorescent colored fish it's like a minivan that was covered in like fluorescent linen and with a fish face on the front of it playing this loud ass music and just driving along. And there was a tractor trailer behind it that had a big Gatorade jug of like spiked vodka and then just a bunch of people just fucking spring breaking on the back of it. Like, That's awesome. <laughs> so I was talking to the girl and I was and she saw my eyes go over there and I perked up and I looked back like, can I, can I? She's just like, yeah, go. So I just ran after that fucking thing like Forrest Gump, hopped on the back. Everybody's naked and shit. Um, you know, I knew it was going to be weird. So I had like deer antlers. <laughs> so I was looking, you know, and I was wearing a loincloth. So, you know, went in Rome. But um, so I'm on the thing and it's the time of my life. I meet this beautiful girl. She gives me this bracelet thing and it has like a little uh, adage attached to it that says something like, you know, you are all that you need to be, something spiritual and, like, uplifting. I was like, wow, this is so incredible. I'm having so much fun. And then the fish stops, and I'm like, oh, is, is the ride over? No. We got pulled over by a fucking ice cream cart. So this ice cream cart comes over and gives every single person on the thing a cone. And it's a cone of uh, rainbow sherbet, which is one of my top two ice creams. So I'm like, this is fucking insane. This is great. We go a little further, and then it stops again. Um, the reason is that we, another car had come in our direction. And this car was, it was like a monster truck, but it was powered by four people with bicycle seats and bicycle pedals. Fuck out of here. Yeah. So they're like, uh, yeah, our fourth guy just left. We need, you know, we need a fourth. So I was like, ah, fuck it. Why not? You know? So I got on there and the next five minutes taught me why socialism will never work. Because I was on there giving my full fucking 25% to those pedals. But everyone else was going like 10%, and it was fucking excruciating getting this thing to go up the road. So uh, we end up catching up to the ice cream cart. And they said, hey, guys, stop. You know, we're going to give you some ice cream. So I'm like, oh, here's my excuse to get off. So I get off, and I go over to get my rainbow sherbet, but they don't have rainbow sherbet anymore. They have chocolate, which is my other fucking favorite ice cream color. So I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Am I making this out of my mind? And so I, at that point, I was like, all right, I have to find someone that does henna tattoos here because something's telling me I need to get fuck yeah everything henna tattooed across my chest. Ten minutes later, I'm in the tent of a man who looks like a more weathered Mickey Rourke and like a girl who's like 25 and cute and possibly a hostage. I don't really know what kind of arrangement these people <laughs> had going on. But the, he had a shirt on, but that was it. So <laughs> I am in this tent and this, this man's balls are right there, and he is kind of tattooing fuck yeah everything across me. There's, like, some, some girl in line behind me waiting to get, like, a butterfly kind of tattooed. It's, it's a madness situation. Um, but, yeah, so I'm telling him, like, wow, this place is so cool. Uh, you know, I just had my favorite kind of ice cream, and then I had my other favorite kind of ice cream. And he's telling me about warrants that he has in Iowa. Like, it was a bit of a weird dynamic. And so uh, I... 
thought, how could I break the ice in the situation? And I was like, oh yeah, I have mushrooms. So I started eating mushrooms with this guy and, uh, you know, we share our moment. He finishes the fuck yeah, everything. And I get out and if you don't know how mu mushrooms go, you got about a half hour before, you know, the magic starts kicking in. That's what I've heard. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm, uh, that's what I heard too. I've never done them. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, I'm walking down the path and as I'm starting to come up on it, um, you know, it's a very euphoric feeling and everybody sees fuck yeah everything across my chest and they are eager to be participatory in this fuck yeah everything experience you know so everybody's stoked and this is a crazy place so i'm getting the craziest offers and i'm trying to stick with the fuck yeah everything ethos but it's tough i straight up i went by a group of people who had a fucking uh mirror out and they were like hey do you want to do a line of breast milk and that was, that was the one thing I didn't do, to the best of my uh, memory. Oh, yeah, but, fuck yeah, almost everything. <laughs> yeah, fuck yeah, almost everything. Um, so I kept going, and, uh, you know, night starts to fall, and there's this girl there that I'd seen earlier in the day who says she can teach anyone how to twerk. And she tried to teach me, and something just does not work with me. Like, I, I am unable to twerk for some reason. There's, I'm just not gifted that way. So, uh I'm fucked up now. People keep giving me drinks and stuff like that. And she's like, you're doing it right now. Here, I thought of a different way to show you. So she's teaching me. And I am I'm drunk enough to be dancing at this point, which is up there for me. And so it involves like kind of like, it was like a hands and knees position that she was teaching me it in. And so I'm doing it. And then I start hearing people cheering. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I am finally doing it. Fuck yeah. And then I realized, no, it wasn't really that. Like the back of my loincloth had gone up and basically my balls and ass were just presented <laughs> to like 30 people, at least half of which I knew already. <laughs> so, so that was embarrassing. Um, you know, night continues to fall. I am drunk. I am dancing around and shit. And uh, a guy comes up to me. It's probably like three in the morning at this point. And he goes, hey, man, how'd you like to have the best Egg McMuffin you've ever had in your entire life? It's like, definitely yeah. fuck yeah, everything to that, you know? Because this is a camping experience. Like, I'm fucking eating, like, bacon and, like, you know, grilled cheeses and shit for the most part. Um, so he's like, all right, come with me. So I'm like, you know, fuck, kill me in the woods if you want to. I, I'm having a great time. Like, it would be super cool if this happens. But he takes me to this little shack they had set up. And it was like a gorilla thing they set up in the middle of the night where they found people that looked like they could use a fucking sandwich. And invited them over there and it turns out this guy and his wife owned a restaurant and so they it was like this asiago ciabatta like all sorts of fancy ingredients egg mcmuffin so i sat down by a campfire near there and i started eating it and was very overwhelmed with the whole experience to the point where i was literally fucking crying tears of joy just blubbering over my egg mcmuffin at that point a guy sat down next to me and he was wearing a chicken mask he just gave me a pat on the back and then just gave a knowing like, <sighs> and he took off the chicken mask. And there was a fucking chicken mask on. <laughs> so so yeah. it sounds like for one night, your life was directed by David Lynch. It was bananas. I've gone several times since then. Um, and there's, you know, I kind of gave the abridged thing where I knew that the timeline was correct. There are some more things. There are some more factors of that trip that were fucking insane. Like the next morning, I was I did not stay in my tent that night. Next morning, I go back to my tent, and I had a big ass bottle of Jaeger, and it was sitting outside of my tent. And so there was just a production line of ants just going in and out of this fucking thing. It was hot. It was a terrible situation. So I went into my tent to grab a water. I came back out. I took the Jaeger so like I wouldn't, it wouldn't be in my tent getting ants and everything like that in there. And the guy walks up to me and he goes, oh, man, can I please have a hit of that? So I pass him the water. And he goes, no, no, the Jaeger. It's like nine in the morning. I'm like, dude, there are ants crawling in and out of this fucking thing right now. He's like, I don't care. Takes a giant pull on it. And that's when I knew, like, I thought I was a wild man. I am jack shit compared to the people that go to these events. So I have a question. Why were you wearing a loincloth? Um, so the theme of it was mythical creatures. And I was like, I don't, you know. I'm not a mermaid, um, unicorn, probably not, but I could be the Jaeger deer. So I was, I was, 
you know, I had my antlers and I was passing out Jägermeister to people. That's cool. Yeah. I can't wait to hear the joke version of that story. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, once I polished it up, like that was, I was not expecting to tell that tonight, but it's it's a great story. 100% true. And it makes for a great first episode of this. All right, some questions real quick. Sure. So what made you start doing comedy? Um, That's a good one. Um, So I've thought about it for years and years and years, and I fucking told people that I wanted to do it for years. Um, One of my buddies is like a big-time musician. What's up, Wiley, if you watch this? And I told him, and he's like, man, yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, I have so much respect for comics because people can come see a band and they can just nod their heads and like act like they're having a good time, but no one's fucking faking laughter. So respect for that. He was like, give me respect for the idea of trying to do it, even though I hadn't yet. So like that stuck with me. And I'm like, man, I'm a piece of shit for not trying to do this. Um, I started dating a girl and she started taking intro to burlesque classes that was like right near my house. Okay. So we'd hang out after she got done with her classes. And uh, after, you know, five or six months, we parted ways and then like, but while we were in the mix of it, she, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I started writing my comedy shit and she was doing her burlesque thing. We're like, oh yeah, we're both pursuing our stage dreams. But I still never went up on stage. So like six or eight months later, I was like, oh, I wonder what she's up to now. So I like checked her out on uh, Instagram, you know, and she had just won Miss Burlesque of Michigan. So I was like, what the fuck, man? I haven't even got on stage yet. I, I suck. Like, I, I got to do something here. So I had to make pressure for myself to do it um a friend that a girl i was talking to at the time i was like yo here's a thousand dollars in my playstation 4 if i don't get on stage in 30 days they're yours so day 29 it was a wednesday and i called up mark ridley's to get on the open mic and i fucking got on which is not (laughs) there's no guarantee when you're going for the mark ridley's open mic that you're gonna get on it's you know the odds are that you will not so like the fact that that worked uh it was pretty incredible and yeah that was about two years ago and a little change and uh yeah never looked back i don't know how did that first time go i thought it was great um i thought i I was like man i fucking crushed it up there uh and then i watched the video of it like two or three months ago i fucking hate watching videos but you know you have to and i mean there was there was the roots of funny in there, but it was a far fucking cry from like how bad I thought I tore shit up up there. You know? Now, did you have friends in the audience for that show, or did you? I I was like I had one friend, and I'm like, yo, just come and videotape this for me, please. Like I don't want more people coming. Like very very timid, and uh, it's a bit of my downfall, I think, a little bit sometimes. I remember the first time I saw you, I think it was uh, at the Art of Armageddon Beach Party last night. Oh, week. yeah. And I remember you like had a whole bunch of people there with you, and I'm like, who the fuck is this guy who could actually get people to come to his shows? Uh, a guy who's early into it, <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah, it, 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 the longer I've been doing it, it's been harder and harder to get people to come to shows. I'm hoping yeah. after this uh, quarantine is over, my friends will want to come see me. Hopefully. Honestly. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird thing to wrestle with, um, how much you put out there and stuff. Um, because, you know, you don't want to, like, ruin the surprise of your act and everything like that. But it seems like it's going to be a while while we're in here. So I'm actually, uh, I'm having uh, Daryl Bean, shout out Daryl, check out the audio on this video I had because I was in the Cannabis Comedy Festival in Toronto in April of last year. And they recorded a video of it, and it's it's dope. Like it's a three camera thing, and it's uh, it's the biggest crowd I've ever played to. It was like six hundred people or something like that in the theater. So I wanted to put that out there. The only problem with the video is uh, there was no mic in the crowd, so you can hear me great. You can't hear the crowd really at all. So Daryl, seeing if you can like crank up the uh, audience like sound a little bit. That's cool. But I'm going to put that out. This is the first time I'm saying anything about it. I'm putting that out um, as soon as he takes a look at it. So next couple of days, I think. Um, and then my goal is that, you know, that material that I used in it, I, I rely on, I lean on pretty heavy. And so when I do a new set or something like that, I'm like, okay, I'll replace one joke. 
And I, I'm making it my goal for this quarantine situation to not use any of those jokes when I go up for the first time next time. Like, uh, they'll, they'll come back, and if I have to have, fill, like, 30 minutes or something like that, they'll definitely be there. But as far as doing 5, 10, 15 minute sets, I'm going to try to do all new. Um, just kind of start from scratch a little bit. I, I've been doing that gradually. I think right before the quarantine ended, I had a new five or seven minutes. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to go cleaner. I don't think it's oh, that dirty, but um, someone who's a booker at one of the bigger clubs, not in Detroit, told me he couldn't use me because my set was too dirty. So I'm going to go, cle- I'm going to go cleaner. And plus, I do think after all this is over, dark jokes might not be in style for a while. Yeah. It's hard to tell with all that, but I, I don't think you're. It's, you're doing no harm by having more clean stuff because the more clean, the more accessible it is. Given That's that, like, Stan Hope's like my favorite comic, and uh, you know, I know he's not. Like, if he went into a fucking room of a hundred random comedy enthusiasts, you know, there'd be some problems. Like, he knows his audience. He writes for his audience, and I would love to be able to do that. But at the same time, trying to get out there more, I'm, I'm trying to have a bit more of a broad approach. I agree. I agree. Because the, the broader the approach, the better, the, the more opportunities you have. All right. So I have two more questions. What, what has been your most memorable show so far? Most memorable show? Hmm. About that for a second. There's one show that comes to mind a lot for me. because And it it didn't set any records in any way. Like... But it encapsulated why I wanted to get into comedy. Um, it was a little show in, I want to say Lapeer. Okay. Brewing Company, Justin CK, CK, or not, not, no, no, it wasn't Justin's. Andrew Hicks? Yes. Okay. Um, at the brewery there? I thought it was at a pizza place, but. Oh, it's Pizza Brewery. Okay. Same thing. Um, and yeah, so. Basically, I, not to get like long wind or something, but uh, I've skateboarded my whole life. And a lot of that wasn't skateboarding itself. It was the sense of adventure. Like I've, I've moved, I've lived in over 30 places. Like most of them before I graduated high school, I moved around a lot. Like lots of changes up in the marital lineup of my parents, divorces, remarriages, all that stuff. So, moved around a bunch and I got kind of more comfortable being uncomfortable. And skateboarding was always looking for new spots, you know, like driving through industrial areas and just trying to find a new place to, you know, with, you know, specific obstacles we could skate on. So I, I treasure new things. And when I went and did this show at that place, um, and yeah, you absolutely called it definitely Andrew Hicks. Um, I don't remember the name of the brewery, but that little, I love little towns like that. And it was a small crowd. I mean, it was pretty much filled up for the seats. There was like 40 people there or something like that. Uh, but Lindsey Rendell and uh, Mike Cronin were there with us. Okay. And I was supposed to be on that show. Oh, shit. But I was in Dubai for work. So. Oh, man. It's a good excuse. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I got there early. I had, I had dinner in the town. I found this. I, have, like, I love barbecue, so there's a good barbecue spot there. But to park there, I had to park in front of this store, and it was like this spooky, like artifact store. Like um, it's called the Auditorium, like odd. And like the owner was this cool, gothy chick, and uh, you know, shot the shit with her for a while. And it was just a bunch of new experiences. And then going into that show, everybody, all the comics were super nice, and the crowd was super warm. And it was just everything that I kind of looked for with doing comedy. You know what I mean? Like, my set was well-received. All the other comics were super cool. Got some drinks, got some food, got a little money. (laughs) Um, That's all you can hope for in comedy is a little money. Yeah, exactly. Someone reached out to me recently, um, and they were like, yeah, yeah. uh, Would you do a show for X dollars? And I was like, whoa, pump the brakes a little bit, guy, because it's a friend of mine. Like. You, I think you don't understand how shitty it is to be a comic on a good day. Like, not only will I do it for that amount of money, I will bring two other people to do 15 minutes. Like, 
So that's awesome. Yeah. But yeah, thanks for that one. Um, I, I wish Andrew was still doing comedy, but he is not. He is not. No, he uh, he is retired. Hopefully temporarily. Ah, uh, hang in there, Andrew. All right. One last thing. So I have uh, over the over the course of this quarantine, I have become addicted to the missed connections thing on Craigslist. <laughs> So I'm going to read one to you, and then I want you to, if you can, make a quick joke about it. Okay? Okay. See what happens. So this one's Blonde at Myers of Allen Park. Talk to you in the checkout lane Friday 3.13, around 3.30 at Myers and Allen Park. Talked about your cat food and cats since you were buying a lot of cat food. You were, you were wearing black pants and a Michigan Rocks black shirt, black purse, and white tennis shoes. The grammar in here is really bad. Blonde hair, if you see this and would like to meet up and have lunch or dinner, let me know. What do you remember about me? Whoa! Is it, you didn't make this up, you promise? Nope. nope, I did not make it up. Holy shit, is the man a crime scene investigator? How does he have all these fucking details? <laughs> really know how to get a lady with your fucked up detective attention to detail, <laughs> yeah? <laughs> But he knows how to spot a lonely woman at the Meyer <laughs> checkout buying cat food. Boom. Got it, sir. Oh, all right. That was great. <laughs> hey. <laughs> all right, Cody, thank you for being a great first guest. I hope to see you sooner than later. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can I add one little thing here? Sure. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, I think it might have been the fourth time I did comedy was with you. Where at? Um, it was a shitty little bar in one of those lake cities to the north, like Farmington Hillsy. Okay. And we got there and it was like this shitty little old man bar. And before we went up, there was like a, a film being shown where everyone that was there was in the movie. Kiko Harbor. <laughs> and it, yeah, Kiko Harbor. And they were drunk as fuck. These old men were drunk as fuck. Oh, I had and a Robert, break on that night. Yeah. <laughs> Robert was first up, and uh, the old men were drunk and not shutting the fuck up. And you took no shit. You're like, shut the fuck up. What the fuck are you doing? And so you try to get out of there. And the old men came up, and they started being like, no, nah, no, don't get out of here. One of the guys picked up a fucking microphone and started singing some fucking crooner show tune shit. The guy who was booking the show was big as fuck, so I knew we had at least some back in there. But... uh yeah, I was just sitting back like, whoa, this is why I did comedy. <laughs> like, no, no. Fucked up moments like this. See, what got me was the fucking guy who made the movie. I was doing my suicide joke. And mm -hmm. he did a fucking call back to his own shitty movie during my <laughs> joke. That just set me off. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it. Oh, man, that was Cheers. a shitty open mic. <laughs> Cheers, Robert. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Good talking to you. You too. Cheers.